Well, hello, my name is Hector Del Castillo, Chief Product Officer of Bold PM, and I want to welcome all of you to tonight's meetup. Tonight's discussion and topic is migrating from legacy systems and legacy mindset. And our speaker tonight is Philip Simulus. Philip is CEO of Simtelligent, and I would like to give a warm welcome to Philip. Philip, how are you doing today? Doing great, thanks, Hector. Appreciate you having me here today. All right, great. And I, I don't want, I don't know if you want to actually um, share your screen. I sh you should be able to do that. So that way you can just drive yourself all the way until the end. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Do you have a, I, I don't know if you want to drive, but yeah, I can, uh, let me see here. I'm going to just, what I'm going to do is try to just share the, uh, the specific slide deck. So give me one second. Yes. Yeah, let me know if it's sharing. I'm sharing my whole desktop, so let me see. Let me know if you see anything weird. Uh, but no, I appreciate the uh, the introduction, Hector. Uh, actually, what I appreciate about it was it was pretty short and concise. You know, a lot of people drone out a whole paragraph of stuff that nobody cares about, right? <laughs> I mean, I am awesome. I could write a whole paragraph, but nobody would listen. Uh, so, uh, you know, the the title and I heard a little bit beforehand that the title was intriguing: migrating from legacy systems and legacy mindset. Uh, so really, you know, to, to everybody that's on here is I am pretty flexible. I'll definitely have a you know, slide deck uh, prepared that I could talk to. But at the same time, I'm uh, definitely willing to entertain uh, conversation and questions throughout, uh, especially if this resonates with you. Uh, so Hector, I'm going to try to see how easily I can advance here. So, OK, so legacy systems, legacy mindset. Uh, you know, the question is, is legacy a bad thing? Uh, yeah, it, it kind of comes inherently in technology. It comes with a, a, a kind of a negative connotation that legacy is old, it's slow, it's bad, it's, uh, you know, COBOL, you know, things like that come to mind. Uh, but on, on the flip side, on the personal level, on the family level, everybody is always worried about leaving a legacy. So legacy in itself is not a bad thing. I kind of try to entertain the, the audience here. And I'm, I'm a big Dilbert fan because I think it uh, resonates very well with me. Uh, I'll kind of paraphrase here, you know, and I'm sure you can read this yourselves, but uh, you know, lady comes to the engineer and says, how long would it take to add a feature to a legacy system? Uh, the engineer, of course, says it depends. When will the new system replace the legacy system? And the lady responds in six months. And the engineer says, well, the new feature will take seven months, right? It's perfect, it cracked me up. It's, it's uh, it's often very hard to uh, update and modernize the legacy systems. So a legacy mindset, uh, and it's a little bit different presenting to a, a virtual crowd here, yeah, so I can't see faces or uh, people raising their hands. But let me ask if you know anybody with a legacy mindset. Uh, typically, if you we were in person, I would say, don't point them out if they're sitting next to you. They, that could be embarrassing. but. Uh, we, we all know somebody that, you know, that might be our boss, or our colleagues, you know, quite honestly, it might, it might be ourselves. Uh, but what I, I thought a little bit about what are some indicators of a legacy mindset? Uh, you know, someone who doesn't necessarily see a big picture, uh, they might be risk adverse. Uh, this one is actually pretty interesting, but is it concerned about what others will think? And uh, while initially sometimes that might not see uh, seem that uh, that big on the scale of things, a lot of times that you know someone's worried about a promotion, they might be worried about taking a risk. Uh, you know, they may not go over well with their boss, or they may be worried about implementing something new that their team is going to roll their eyes and say, "Oh, here we go again." You know, just you know something new, something different. Uh, some people, uh, you know, they say we've always done it this way. Uh, this is you know kind of how it's done. You know. People who are afraid of change, uh, you know, there's whole uh, you know companies out there that special, uh, specialize in change management. <laughs> the one that that I, I thought of personally, but it's they reference other legacy thinkers. So you may have a legacy mindset if you're always looking to other legacy mindset people uh, to corroborate your ideas. Yeah, you know, everyone's always looking. This is actually from a previous presentation, but I wanted to include it. Everyone a, a lot of time is looking for a you know, somebody to blame, they're looking for a scapegoat. Uh, you know, so a leader without a budget oftentimes get, gets blamed, uh, but it does, it's not always the budget's fault. You know, when we look at legacy mindset, 
Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers Kodak film. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, they had an opportunity to go digital uh, at the beginning, but they didn't have the the vision. And that was one of the indicators is having the big picture vision. Uh, they did not have the vision to to believe that the world was really going to go digital. We could see how that went. Blockbuster, again, yet leaders with uh, with narrow with narrow vision didn't have the big picture view, and. Uh, they actually uh, had a chance, two different opportunities to, to purchase Netflix. And you think, wow, that was a great opportunity. And uh, there was three driving reasons that the leadership said, we, you know, we don't need to buy Netflix. You know, the world isn't going to go you know, digital. They're not going to stream movies primarily. And uh, you know, the reasons are that, well, people like, you know, coming to the store and browsing for movies. Right? That was a mindset of, of the blockbuster leadership. Uh, they also said, believe it or not, and, and I'm not making this up, right? <laughs> Scout's honor. You know, they said that uh, you know people like the serendipity of running into their neighbors while they're looking for movies. And the third reason, uh, again, I'm, I'm being I'm being truthful here, but the third reason is they said people like buying popcorn and buying snacks uh, while they wait in line to check out. So those those are the three you know three of the driving reasons uh, to not go digital. You know, Sears also. Uh, you know, didn't really have a big picture vision. They didn't understand that the way the world was going to change. And uh, in many cases, some of these Sears stores actually signed 99-year uh, leases. So you imagine you know, a giant store for all these giant uh, stereos and, and giant everything that existed uh, years ago that everything now is, is small or even obsolete. Uh, and it's funny because a lot, of, a lot of times it catches people off guard. Uh, what they don't understand is uh, you know things things in life move a lot faster sometimes uh, than it seems that they might be. If, you, if you've ever kind of seen a storm out on the horizon, uh, you know, one of my favorite stories was uh, the hurricane that hit Florida you know, just a few years ago, not not many years ago, and there was a uh, security footage of a, a guy doing a selfie video. Yeah, uh, so you can see the kind of the storm, you know, kind of the hurricane coming in, you know, the waves crashing, uh, you know, against the barricade. And there's a guy standing on there. He's got a selfie camera and he's you know, looking at the waves. And all of a sudden, you know, monster wave comes and just like slams when he goes flying. Uh, he reportedly, when he's asked what he was doing out there, he, he thought he had more time. He thought the storm was further away. So a lot of times in technology, Hector, you were kind of mentioning with you know, the pandemic, the way uh, it forced some businesses to really rethink things in a hurry. So looking at legacy systems, we talked about indicators of legacy mindset. We'll talk about indicators of legacy systems, uh, believe it or not, these are all, these are all true and I've experienced, uh, I believe, all of these. The lost source code, you might, you might be a legacy system if you've ever heard the uh, Jeff Fox, Fox word, the, uh, you might be a redneck jokes. You, know, you might be a legacy system if nobody knows what your source code is. Um, I've seen that in multiple uh, uh, you know, commercial environments as well as uh, the public sector. Uh, an old system that's just been working, but nobody knows what a source code is. And it's time to modernize. It's time to, uh, to refactor the code and nobody knows where it's at. Uh, you know, if updates are taking weeks or months of testing, you might be a legacy system. Uh, a lot of times it's just working with outdated technology. You know, we do have a customer that modernized two years ago. And I said, great, you know, they're going to the cloud right now. But they modernized two years ago. What did you do to modernize? And they said, well, you know, we were a classic ASP and we modernized to VB.net. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so as, uh, you know, two years ago, they, they did this. And so now, now they're trying to go to the cloud. Uh, and this actually, this, this would apply to the example I just gave you, uh, you know, no easy way to communicate with other systems. Uh, that modernization to VB.net includes all the uh, business logic and the communications layers all built, uh, you know, all, all tightly coupled together in, in the same code with, with no API considerations. Uh, if a product has had multiple owners, I've seen this uh, you know, within, within clients and I've seen it within just product companies. A lot of times uh, you know, somebody has a great product and you know, Hector, maybe this would be a question for you. What typically happens is, you know, somebody has a great product and a larger company buys it out and we don't have to pick on Microsoft, but we can look at LinkedIn or we can look at Skype. You know, what happens when, when a large company buys them out? You know, a lot of times, you know, number one, you have to, you have to bring it in your own environment. 
uh, you, you put your own flavors on there, and a lot of times the product suffers, and uh, customers aren't as happy as they used to be. And we, is that Absolutely, that that, that happens a lot, and and um, often, um, I I would say companies like Microsoft do this all the time, right? They acquire, you know, if you look at what happened to Skype after Microsoft acquired them, right? Um, you know, typically that's typically what they try to do is, you know, they try to put their own product when they can't get the traction that they are looking for they will look to acquire the leader and often it'll be to sort of like retire them or, you know, it's not necessarily to, to improve the, the user experience. Sometimes it just gets worse. Yeah, absolutely. And I've seen in some cases a product, uh, you know, go through three different hands uh, and actually a couple of different occasions I've seen it go through three different hands. And it gets to the point that uh, code maintenance is a nightmare You've had three different teams developing it, maintaining it. Uh, yeah, you know, every, if you've ever had developing experience, you know that every time a new developer picks up a system, they look at the code and they say, oh, these other developers are idiots, right? And they uh, <laughs> they do it their own way. And then the new guy comes in and says, oh, the other guys are idiots, right? It's, it's just kind of a programming thing or <laughs> programmer thing. It's, it's, it happens in real life. Uh, but uh, users who find systems cumbersome. You have a simple job to do, and, and there's no easy way to do it. Another indicator that you might have a legacy system. So what is a legacy system? Uh, I felt like this wouldn't be a legitimate presentation if I didn't include a reference from Gartner. So a <laughs> uh, legacy system defined. You know, Gartner says it's an information system that may be based on outdated technologies, but it's critical to day-to-day -day operations. Uh, so, yeah, it might be based on, you know, VB.net or classic ASP or, or, or even COBOL in, in many cases uh, in some industries. But what is going on behind the scenes is critical. Uh, they do go on. They have a, a, a larger, uh, it's not a definition necessarily, but it, it, they go on to, uh, to say that this is actually kind of the crux of most uh, professionals' significant challenges. And uh, you must ensure compatibility with old systems and data formats that are still in use. I mean, I think anybody that's doing any kind of migration understands that. It's easier said than done, though. So what does it really mean? I, you know, I was like, well, let me, let me put my own definition in place. And so I wrote that this is a work in progress. Uh, I said a system or portion of system that, and I should say systems, that's why it's a work in progress, right? <laughs> it's a system or portion of systems that prevents or slows your ability of adding value for your customers and stakeholders. Uh, and I wrote after that that it's a work in progress because I'm like, well, you know, technically that could be a lot of things. You know, it could be the latest, greatest, you know, cloud application that's not configured very well and it could still prevent your users from uh, doing their, their tasks. So, uh, you know, th that fact that I wrote here doesn't necessarily mean it's a, a legacy system, but I can say that that's uh, very true of many legacy systems. And it, it's really about the value. Uh, after I wrote a few notes during your introduction and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of things. You know, in, even in private sector, a lot of times people think government and just kind of mock it. But everything really exists to, you know, at least for all my stakeholders, they really truly want to add value to, you know, the stakeholders within the federal agency or agencies, as well as the customers, which many times are, are the public. You know, uh, the people that I work with in the government truly do care. Uh, it's not always. Uh, it doesn't always seem that way. But, you know, looking at, you know, value streams is, is one of the ways that uh, a lot of businesses and federal agencies are looking at modernizing their mindset, you know, so focusing on the value, what is the value that we're adding? And, uh, you know, you, you've heard of Agile, I'm sure, and uh, they have what's called a safe Agile. And a lot of that is focused on, uh, you know, value streams. So what is the value that you as an organization are actually providing? Uh, and what are the pieces that you need to actually get there? And then some of your development teams are actually, uh, you know, called release trains. And so each of those are actually delivering, uh, you know, the products that they deliver directly affect the value that you're you know, presenting out to the public uh, or other stakeholders. Uh, that was, you know, I took a few notes and that was one of them I thought that would make sense to bring up now. Uh, but really focusing on the value and not just here's a cool tool. So, so this is a screenshot. I was very careful. Let me know if it's, it's not. I, I did... Uh, sanitize this, uh, you know, because this actually does represent uh, more than one actually uh, client, but it was specifically does represent clients. They have, you know, we'll call it system A, and it's 
why I wrote this, uh, you know, blocks around it and firewall. And the reason being is because it's really, uh, it really segregated from the outside world. You know, it can communicate on their internal network, but could not communicate uh, with uh, hosted systems like hosted Power BI or hosted uh, you know, Office 365, SharePoint, and things like that. So what they did is, you know, they have a box here with, uh, with manual and automated processes that uh, you can communicate here. And then it can actually, uh, you know, because it's within the network and then when it's off the network, it can actually dump data out on SharePoint or other file servers. Uh, and, you know, then system B could actually access that data. And so the reason I included this picture here wasn't to you know, give you a, a lesson in uh, subpar uh, architecture, <laughs> really, but it's, you know, if you look at the lines here, there's not many systems involved. There's really just kind of two systems. And, to, in order to communicate with everything it needs to communicate with, uh, you know, whether SharePoint or supporting file servers, uh, you know, they need to connect in, uh, individually to each of those environments. So in looking and say, okay, here's system B, what would a, a system B uh, kind of 2.0 modernized look like? And uh, yeah, in reality, it's like, well, number one, it has to connect to system B's database. It's like, okay. And it still needs to connect to supporting files and uh, you know, SharePoint and things like this. So you're building a connector. Well, what if you want on the left here, a new tool? Oops, sorry, let's see here. Uh, what if you want a new tool? Well, I guess a new tool means that you have to build these connectors all over again or, or copy and paste, so to speak, uh, you know, the code for these connectors. And uh, you know, it's, not a, it's not a great model. So ultimately, which I'm not including here, but you know, uh, modernized architecture would include uh, you know, some type of API layer where each system is now uh, you know, communicating you know, through API layers uh, with their databases, but then it uh, very easily gives a, uh, you know, for example, system B the ability to talk to system A uh, or system A to access uh, any kind of uh, files or uh, you know, SharePoint files that it needs to. Uh, same thing with Power BI reports, they don't have to rely on uh, multiple files from, from different places. Yeah, and in fact, that was one of the one of the things with Power BI reporting is well, we don't have access to System A's data. So, okay, here's these manual processes, automated processes. Let's dump some data over here on, on SharePoint, and then Power BI can pull from a, a number of sources. It can parse the data on SharePoint uh, Excel files and CSV files and generate reports. It's like, well, how often does that happen? You know, well, once a week, twice a week, whatever it is. So you never have the latest greatest data. Uh, I mean, it's better than nothing, I suppose, right? I mean, you know, but at the same time, uh, you know, users are complaining. It's uh, there's no easy way to do that, and a lot of times, so what you're know, saying is that if you require real time uh, of whatever is coming up from System A, there's no real time. It's it's all there's a lag from when you pull information from System A and now make it available on your SharePoint or other uh, in in the other system. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, in that real time, not even near real time. It's, it's called far from real time. Right? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, all, all, you know at, at the best case scenario, a lot of agencies uh, yeah, and uh, commercial sector, you know, they'll run these nightly batch processes, which you know, we've seen forever. Right? Insurance companies run them. Uh, fintech companies, you know, everybody's running these nightly batch processes. Uh, and, and in fact, one of the systems, uh, you'll know, call it system B here, uh, in real time really does need access to system A data while users are interacting with system B. And so that's just not there. Uh, and by the way, system B here is actually using, uh, you know, some legacy software. And, uh, you know, and that actually that, that's, you know, I don't, don't want to get into it too much, you know, because I want to make sure we have time for questions and further discussion. But uh, it's interesting because uh, sometimes the legacy software, you know, vendors who support it, uh, you know, they may have been there for a while and may have the trust of the customer and they're telling the customer, look, we can, we can do everything you need. We just need more time. We need more money. We just need to configure it differently. And the customer keeps forking over those dollars, right? And uh, yeah, at some point, you know, enough is enough. And uh, we'll get into that just in a, in a little bit here. And I'm happy to address this. some of the stuff I'm going by. I just want to make sure we have enough time. So I'm happy to revisit some of these uh, topics, but I figured that there's a, there's going to be a little bit more of, of interest besides, uh, you know, just talk about legacy people, <laughs> but why, you know, why modernize, right? I mean, you know, 
a number, you know, one of the bottom ones that I, I wrote down is actually, uh, you know, some people modernize because they're told they need to modernize. They need to go to the cloud. They, you know, hey, the cloud is sexy. We, we, need, we need to be there. Uh, interestingly enough, some people have migrated to the cloud to find out that, well, we're actually spending more in the cloud than, the, than the, we were on-prem. So now we're going to go back to on-prem. Uh, and and that quite, quite honestly, it's, a, it's another conversation. We, we may have part of that here. Uh, you know, systems coming to end of life. You know, might be a, a reason to modernize or a good time to modernize. Uh, when you find that new features are challenging to add, they don't integrate easily with your current processes or with the current tools that you have. Uh, the users, you know, can't interact with your system in a, in a meaningful way to get their job done. Uh, tedious processes and, and siloed systems that can't easily share data. You know, we, we talked about that just a few minutes ago. You know, there's going to be other reasons to modernize, but a lot of times, you know, my advice is going to be about the value that you're offering. So, you know, what, what value, again, to your stakeholders and customers are you trying to add uh, or are you trying to deliver? And then what are those tools to actually do that? And, and if the tools don't exist or the tools that you currently have don't allow you to deliver that value, it's probably a great time to modernize. I included these. I'm going to cover them uh, very briefly, this is actually from a different presentation, but as I was looking at it, I was like, you know, some of these points are still very valid and quite, you know, I think I delivered this presentation, you know, almost about a year and a half, almost two years ago. But this is more about innovation, but what are the barriers to innovation? We look at leadership, culture, outdated processes, uh, too much data, but one that caught my mind and my eye here was lack of technical capabilities. And this is something that really slows down modernization as well. So when you're trying to uh, you know, modernize legacy systems, you know, lack of technical capabilities is actually a very big barrier. Uh, this one I'm going to skip over. Uh, when we look at leadership, we, dis we did discuss that uh, a little bit, and I'm happy to come back to it. Uh, why I kept leadership in here, this was actually from uh, food manufacturing companies, uh, but it was interesting that uh, in 2015, only 36% of dairy CEOs believed in non-dairy. They really, nobody really, I shouldn't say nobody, right? But the other percentage was it 64% uh, of CEOs polled didn't really think that non-dairy was gonna take off. Hey, everybody drinks milk, people like yogurt. You know, we're not gonna be going uh, you know, almond milk and, and coconut. You know, this, this wasn't gonna be a thing. Uh, by 2018, and in fact, uh, let me see, I think I, I actually deleted that slide, but uh, uh, Hector, yeah, I can't think of the event that happened in 2017, but uh, dairy consumption was actually uh, very low by the end of 2017. And because of that, in 2018, 51% uh, of CEOs uh, who are now believers saying, okay, yeah, I guess the writing's on the wall. People are actually drinking, you know, but the problem is now you're three years behind. And I know this is dairy and we're talking about, you know, federal agencies or we're talking about other, uh, you know, commercial businesses. But this is very indicative of how a lot of uh, a lot of businesses run. You know, they see, you know, here's an indication uh, of something that may happen. To, you know, but they say that ah, it's more of a fad. It's not going to happen. Three years later, oh, holy cow! No pun intended. It is happening, right? And uh, now it's almost too late. How are you going to be competitive when you have some of these top uh, you know, dairy providers who have been already offering dairy-free alternatives? How do you catch up? Yeah, because now it's a complete it's a complete uh, redo on your supply chain, right? And that supply is chain, hard. That your is products hard in the execute. stores. What, what do you do? You recall what the lag time is to actually get a product produced and actually get it on the shelves? I mean, it's it's at least a year or more, right? At least a year, yeah. And and the 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 issue is that you know um, the farmers that have been producing cow milks, right? Where do they go? Because if demand is going down and nobody has told them, and even if you tell them a year ahead, what are they going to do with their dairy cows? You know, that, so a lot of this takes some time and, and you mm -hmm. better be proactive in figuring out how to implement this if it happens. Because if you have no plan, it is extremely hard. And actually, um, you know, a lot of things can go south. Who filed for bankruptcy just, just about a year or, or more ago? I guess, honestly, the COVID really threw me off. We kind of lost a year there. I guess they, was it, uh, was it Dean? 
it, it was a big uh, it was a big uh dairy uh brand and I, I can't remember the the exact details i'll see if i can look them up and then we can do that during q a sure yeah i think that was definitely very interesting but it, these aren't necessarily mom and pop uh shops that, that have bad vision a lot of times it's, it's very well-known companies that we already went through some of the slides <laughs> you know uh, some some very large companies sometimes are, are making these blunders here uh key barriers of too much data it can uh, you can get analysis by uh, paralysis by analysis. Uh, you have so much data. What data do you need? What data is useful? Uh, what data needs to be cleaned up and sanitized? Uh, it causes people a lot of delay. I put culture and process here, and I actually want to stop on you know this slide. It seems. Do we have anybody else join? Hey, go back one. All right. Uh, so we had you know, Jaws. What you said earlier. Uh, introducing yourself a little bit kind of resonated with me as well, you know, being that we, we both, uh, you know, serve the federal industry as well. Uh, one, one thing that makes uh, this environment a little bit different than uh, commercial, at least how I see things is you have your, you know, commercial, you have your, you know, your C-suite level, you have kind of middle management, you have your product teams and, and you have your products. Uh, the federal government has a layer kind of in the middle, uh, you know, toward the bottom, but it, it's the contract layer, right? They, you know, the federal government has their, their management. Uh, they have a vision of what they want to do. Uh, they hire, you know, they bring out contracts and, you know, these are one year, you know, three year, five year contracts. And the interesting part is, you know, they're, they're oftentimes they're funded, they have a scope. Uh, so you, you can do certain things, you can't do certain things within your contract, but, uh, you know, the technology world is moving a lot faster than it used to. Uh, you know, so it used to be you go to school, learn COBOL, and you're set for life or you know, a good portion of your life. You know, now a skill set is really only relevant, relevant for about three to five years. And uh, that's one area that I'm very intrigued on the federal side is, you know, how do you keep things moving forward at, at, a, at a good pace while you may have a, a contract that, that says, okay, we, you know, here's our needs of a contract. There's staff that's staffing the contract, but all of a sudden the needs are changing, but we're still we kind of use the word stuck with this contract and we can't really modernize uh, the way we need to. And so you're almost kind of behind the ball. Uh, you know, not only that, but, you know, within, let's say an agency, they, if they have a goal, hey, we're going to modernize and we're going to get uh, all of our legacy systems in the cloud by such and such a date. Well, all these different contracts have uh, different start and end periods. And so it's really hard sometimes to, uh, you know, to kind of get everybody on the same page. There's something I'm actually really, really curious, really passionate about and would love to talk more about, but I wanted to point that out here to this group uh, that that's to me a key, in, key difference between federal and commercial it is kind of that contracts layer. Uh, so I also included outdated processes on here, and I, and I think that this is something that we, we've already covered, and I'm looking at, uh, you know, these outdated processes really uh, include things that we discussed, which, you know, nightly batch processes, and, and not that there's anything wrong with those, but uh, when you don't have any real-time or near real-time systems or, or access to your data, and everything's re uh, relating on, uh, you know, nightly batch, weekly batch processes, it's really going to slow things down. Uh, so you know, look at the time to upgrade technical capabilities being another key barrier. One thing that, uh, and I'm just watching the time here too, Hector. Uh, one thing that I see a lot, and, and I'm happy to talk about this for just a few minutes and then offline, uh, we talk about this all night long. Uh, you know, the technical capabilities, you know, a lot of times you have a team and I'll be generous here. You know, I, I'm a little bit, uh, it may be hard on product teams that they don't deliver. So I'll be generous. And let's say you have a product team that's uh, maintaining or developing software. Uh, let's say that they're amazing at their job. Maybe they're Java developers or .NET or whatever. I'm not picking on, on that technology at all. So let's say they're amazing at their job. But now, halfway through the contract, it's time to migrate to the cloud. I don't see that successful very often uh, with that team. And you know, the reason is, is you, know, you have a team that's there to, to do their job and now you're asking them to do something completely different, which is be cloud experts. And uh, you know, that does take some time. 
Uh, so without the right staff, uh, you know, having successful migrations, uh, whether it's you know data migration or you know legacy system software migration, can be quite challenging. Uh, and this goes back to something I mentioned earlier: is you know, the cost. A lot of times, people uh, find out that it costs a lot more in the cloud. And one of the reasons that we find is that people are just kind of doing a lift and shift. Uh, I have to get to the cloud. So I'm gonna take my current system that's running on a couple of VMs on-prem. I'm gonna move it to Azure AWS and I don't really know my throughput. I don't really know my traffic needs and my data needs. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create two big VMs over here in the cloud and those are gonna be expensive. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a small project by the way. You know, but not only do you have production, you have your pre-prod or staging environments, you have your test and development environments. And all of a sudden, I mean, you're spending thousands a month in the cloud and people are looking at this and saying, you know, we were spending less on-prem. And uh, you know, the reason is going to be in part of technical capabilities. Uh, people don't necessarily know how to get to the cloud. They just know they need to. So they go to the path of least resistance, right? Um, and also on the federal side, they have their ATO. Uh, I don't, I'm assuming everybody in the call is familiar with ATO, but your authority to operate. So let's go through a whole security process. And uh, one of the things I, I took as a note to, to talk about uh, at this point actually is, uh, I, I think I put it as a slide here. So we skipped a case study for now. Yeah, this is under the modernizing slide. DevOps and DevSecOps uh, you know, is huge in a, a commercial and federal right now. Uh, most people that I've seen are DevOps. They do call themselves DevSecOps, and probably because you have to, right? I mean, if you just tell people, hey, I'm DevOps, you're kind of a loser, right? You got to be DevSecOps. <laughs> hey, don't, don't not be offended. I'm, I'm just playing here. But uh, in reality, though, people aren't incorporating the security teams during the development process. And so it's, you know, yeah, we'll be agile. We'll, we'll kind of have a DevOps and we'll, you know, we'll build our releases and we'll test and everything. But now here's our product that's going to production. And so let's get security, God bless it, and get our ATO. You know, in reality, uh, and, and there's there's some challenges behind that. A lot of agencies don't have the, uh, you know, the security resources to matrix out and kind of dedicate to each project. Uh, so there, there's some some logistical challenges, but uh, that's one thing that, that's slowing people down from migrating successfully to the cloud and in a timely manner. Uh, what I hear often is that, hey, migrating to the cloud is easy, but getting your ATO is hard. Uh, so that's... If anyone's taking notes, if you become a, a ATO guru, I make a lot of money. Uh, just you know, cut me, cut me some of that. Looking to see if there's anything else really. Okay, so Amazon. Uh, let's see here if I can bring this up without actually interrupting the slideshow. Do you still see the slideshow? Uh, we can see your browser actually. Oh man. Okay. Well, that was a fail. Okay, so I forget, I don't want to bore you with the, uh, my browser here, but uh, you know, AWS you know, claims that you know, it's somewhere between 40 or 60% reduction in, in total cost of ownership on the system when you migrate to AWS. Um, I would suspect that, that Microsoft Azure is going to claim something similar. But again, you're going to see that if you've done it right. And that's why uh, you know, we looked at tech, lack of technical capabilities uh, one, one of the areas actually on the federal side we've had a lot of success is, yeah, people, people are lacking the technical capabilities. Even prime companies uh, haven't focused on it necessarily. Uh, they've been focusing on you know, maintaining certain federal systems. Uh, they've been bringing us in as a subcontractor. That, so now instantly they have the right technical capabilities. So we're helping write, you know, as intelligent, we're helping write proposals and actually deliver to the clients. Uh, you know, so you, you take a company who didn't have that and boom, all of a sudden, now they do. So we're, we're seeing a lot of success around there. Uh, it's actually a really exciting time. Uh, you know, there's, you always have the concept of the early adopters. You know, we've been hearing about cloud for, I don't even know how many years. I got tired of hearing about it. <laughs> I thought everybody was in the cloud already. It turns out they're not. And uh, you know, now you have... Hector, would you say it's clear? It's fair to say, uh, kind of the cloud laggards. Is, is that fair? Yes. You know, and so now you have people that need to catch up for a variety of reasons, and they're hungry for that right help. So, 
it's an ancient Chinese proverb, right? The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Uh, so for anybody out there that hasn't, uh, hasn't modernized, you know, still running legacy systems. And again, you know, the legacy systems may run fine. Uh, but if they're not delivering the value that you need to be delivering, if it's not customer focused and customer centric, then now is definitely the best time to modernize. Uh, Hector, I put a slide on here for a requested demo. Uh, one thing I, maybe I'll cover a couple last minute points here, uh, just cause they were after the fact that I did the slide deck. Um, if anybody's familiar with infrastructure as code, and you know, that's a way that we do it, but it, you know, we don't own the IP on that. Uh, it's a very, very common thing, but most people don't understand, but it's, we were working with a team who needed to migrate to the cloud. And so they were showing me their process of setting up new VMs. They said, okay, well, first we have to install this software. Then we install this software and we do all these configurations on, on our Linux server. And then when I'm done, I hand it over to this guy and then he runs a series of scripts and they showed me how they run their scripts. And it's a file, right? With a bunch of scripts, right? And boom, 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 boom. Well, they copy the first one, copy the second one, copy the sixth one, copy the third one. Think about it for a minute, copy the tool. I'm like, wait a second, you don't do these in order? Like, <laughs> that was like the, the, the biggest shock for me. You don't even run your scripts in order. What's going on here? I guess it's a uh, job security, you know, it's uh, security through obfusc obfuscation, I suppose. I don't know. But uh, so the idea behind infrastructure as code is, uh, you know, using we use Terraform and Ansible for AWS and Azure. And uh, you know, what that does is allows you to consistently spin up the same environment every single time. And part of that DevOps and DevSecOps environment is you can, you know, developers can spin something up, run something, test something, and, you know, shut it off. So now you're not using additional cloud resources. Um, you know, it, it runs as code. So now it's something you can check in your source control. If you've ever managed any system, and I've been guilty of this myself in the past, uh, more times than I want to admit, <laughs> is, uh, you know, you run a couple of servers, maybe you run a, a, you know, a dev test, the staging and a production servers, and you make a configuration change on your test server. And now, now whatever didn't work works. But now you're your production server, you're like, great, what did I do on my test server? Yeah, I don't remember. And now you're sitting there comparing all these different settings and everything else, and it's a nightmare. So with something like infrastructure as code, it removes that and it allows you to consistently uh, deploy the same thing to every environment. Uh, so definitely very powerful. Uh, and that's one of the things that we can do a demo on is uh, what we've been doing around infrastructure as code and DevOps. Uh, backup and restore is interesting, especially with uh, cloud solutions. But what I wanted to talk about for a second was the concept of kind of being proactive, right? Uh, you know, in cloud, and you can do this on-prem, but a lot of people don't, is you can run a multi-region failover. So the fact that if you run two regions hot side by side, if something, you know, if you're doing self-health self uh, self health reporting, an environment can say, hey, I'm not healthy, essentially, right, is what it says. And the orchestrator says, hey, I'm not getting, I'm not getting a healthy report from these guys, let's redirect over here. Uh, you know, that could be a, a real-time proactive uh, backup and restore approach versus, you know, let's stand up a new database and, and grab the data from over here because you're running a hot, hot environment. Uh, also, scaling horizontally is something that a lot of people have had success with, and that's, that's an area that we help with as well with, uh, through our infrastructure as code, which is, hey, instead of running two or, or 10 big VMs and you're load balancing between these and you're sucking up all your, your financial resources, you know, there's uh, something called horizontal scaling. And so you can define the minimum and maximum servers that you need. And uh, it would start with the minimum. And as traffic picks up, it, it instantly spins up identical instances to, to handle that load. And as soon as that load goes back to normal, then those, those uh, servers shut off or, or uh, you know, get decommissioned. So th those are definitely ways to handle a lot of the challenges. Uh, but where I wanted to leave, I think, Hector, I think I'm, I'm out of notes and probably out of time here. Uh, but if anybody wants to see a demo or, or further see how we help you know, solve a lot of these challenges, absolutely happy to put something on the calendar and make that happen. So Hector, I'll pass it back to you for any questions you might have or anybody else. Actually, you just put it on, on your slide for your contact information. We can do the Q&A with that slide on. Oh, and perfect. I, I don't see any questions just yet, but I, uh, I wanted to ask the audience, if you have any questions, be sure to either type them into the chat or you can actually open up your mics and ask Philip. But I do wanna point out, I found the article, actually it was an article 
from the Washington Post that was published back in January of 2020, uh, stating that Borden Dairy uh, filed for bankruptcy in January 2020, and it was only about eight weeks after the the largest uh, dairy producer, which is Dean, had yeah, filed for bankruptcy as well. So actually, what you talked about, it's not just Dean, it's the number one and the number two dairies went file for bankruptcy within two months of each other because of this issue you spoke about where they they were not counting on people moving away from drinking uh, dairy products to non-dairy products that were basically substitutes like oat milk, almond milk, you know, all, all these other things that have come been springing up. And those have been emer- uh, kind of rising pretty quickly in the last, I want to say five years. And both that caused both Borden and Dean to file for bankruptcy because it was extremely hard for them to shift their business model to actually begin a non-dairy, you know, division or unit. Right. And and ramp and and sort of like what they could have done if they would have done this proactively, they would have ramped up slowly a non-dairy non-dairy division to create non-dairy products that would you know as they would throttle back down dairy production, dairy product production, they could have also been ramping up on the non-dairy product production. And and actually we saw this also because uh, I remember uh, you and I went to a a food manufacturing conference, I think in 2019, and Shovani was there. there, um, And actually they were touting how you know, they, they were already working with new types of yogurts that were non-dairy yogurts. And this was, yeah. you know, two years ago because they had seen this, this trend and they had in the same facility, it was such a large facility that they never really ran um, at full production. They would always have uh, about a third of this, you know, tens, tens of thousands of square feet of production where they would now have a um, tinkering area where they would be c- coming up with ways to produce non-dairy yogurt. And on the other end, they were producing dairy products, a dairy yogurt all, all day long. Uh, and they had, uh, you know, in the same location, just different staff working on non-dairy uh, alternatives that they were already testing in markets. And, and that, right. that, that was the, the safe bet for them because Giovanni is still around and now they're producing not just the regular yogurt uh, dairy products that they've been producing, but also they now have introduced non-dairy products of their own. Yeah, and, that was interesting. And I, see, uh, I saw, I don't know if you have more on that, uh, Jazz, and hopefully I'm saying your name properly, but uh, I raised your hand. Yes, a question for you, Philip. So have you found that, um, have you encountered in an organization or in a company where you have one team or one department that is innovating and then another team that is stuck with a legacy mindset? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and quite honestly, I, I think that's a huge barrier. Um, in the people factor, because uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, some clients just don't innovate. And, and I've actually had one client tell me because he didn't want to work with this department. <laughs> so that's why he wasn't going to do the best approach. So I've actually seen that uh, multiple times. Uh, is there anything that in particular you want me to delve into on that? Um, maybe maybe how uh, we've tried to address that at all? I think I've encountered that and it's tied to that layer that you spoke about contracts and okay. budgets where you have maybe one organization that just has a bigger budget and that allows them just to just fly. And then you have another organization that um, maybe didn't plan for certain resources, certain assets. And um, you just, I've just personally seen these disparities in, in how applications are developed, how processes are improved. And I, I can never, you know, I'm a worker, V, but I'm like, how don't these organizations reconcile? Hey, they're doing great stuff over there. We should be applying that as well. So that's that's just something I'm 
I'm starting to see and didn't know if that's common and don't even know how to, there's nothing to influence there, but. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I don't know if super common is a actual word, but I'm going to use it. <laughs> I think it's quite common. Uh, you know, we, we've seen that where you see, hey, you know, this team is really doing some great stuff. Uh, but it could be tied to the contract because, you know, over here, the team is slow. They don't, they're not doing great stuff. I mean, maybe they're doing okay stuff. Uh, quite often, not always, right? They're barely barely getting by. Uh, and, and this is a whole different conversation. I know we're being recorded here, so I have to be careful. But, you know, quite honestly, a lot of, a lot of primes uh, bid and they win on cost. But then they have a hard time staffing it with the, re the right resources that can actually uh, add the value that, that's promised in the proposal. And uh, that's that's the truth. I know it kind of sounds harsh. I'll stand by and defend myself. And anybody that wants to debate me on that, uh, actually, I have a related a related question on that, uh, Philip. Because I was wondering, you know, uh, what type of positioning has happened when uh, last year after this uh, it was announced, multi billion dollar contract that had gone from Department of Defense to for, to AWS. And then the administration at the time didn't like AWS, didn't like uh, the CEO of, of AWS and ended up uh, actually changing it, you know, cutting off that contract and then giving it to Microsoft. But in the background, you, you know that there's going to be a huge hidden cost in making that change because of, you know, AWS was already preparing to, to do a lot of that. This is the reason why also HQ2 and ended up in Arlington, right? Amazon's uh, HQ2. And once that decision was made, you know, in the middle of that, the contract was, was actually uh, canceled and then given to Microsoft in instead. We're not seeing any, any reports on that, but I know there's going to be hidden costs in making that last minute uh, cancellation of, of, of the contract and now giving it to a different vendor, not just from the litigation it, side, it but in, in, how, in how the architecture that had already been planned using AWS infrastructure, now they had to re-architect to go with Microsoft instead. Okay, interesting interesting question. Um, and and Jazz, too, I'll lean on you for, for help on answering this, but in my experience so far, uh, the agencies that we've been involved with were not affected uh, because they were so far behind, they weren't to that point of architecting anything yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know, Jazz, if you saw something similar or if you know of people who had to go back and re-engineer. I've seen a little bit of it on the news, but for me, there's so many clouds. The Gov clouds and the Mill clouds and the DOS and the that I don't know specifically which, which customers are affected, wouldn't, wouldn't know. So Hector, one thing I would, would uh, go, lean back to, and this is actually one of the reasons that we really ramped up our Azure efforts, because you, you know, initially we were primarily AWS, just like the other millions of companies, right? Everybody does AWS. Uh, when I heard about that initially, we kind of doubled down on our Azure capabilities. We were the only ones that I really, and there's other ones that do it too, but I didn't know of many. I knew tons of AWS competitors. And that's one of the things that really helped us be successful because in a lot of our, our federal environments, you know, they're, they're actually running both. They run Azure and AWS. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that allowed us to come in as subcontractors with the Azure expertise, get our foot in the door, uh, and then start having some of these modernization conversations. You know, and in fact, I had a conversation the other day with two different stakeholders, uh, one more technical than the other. And uh, you know, the one the one guy sees our, our our slide deck about you know how we can modernize in the cloud and, and and how it should look. And the other one said, "Well, I get it, but I'm not quite sure how." You know, so where he was focused was more on the user side of things. Believe it or not, to get data into a system, users have to fill out a spreadsheet. You know, here's all the stuff I have. Put it in a spreadsheet. And then it has to get massaged, and then that spreadsheet actually gets loaded into a database. Believe it or not, it works that way today. Um, you know, the goal is obviously to have something much more efficient. And so, what, what I'm going to actually do is uh, go back, and, and this is something we've had success with, is 
a lot of times I'll have, you know, one of my team members mock something up super quick and lightweight using, like say no JS and uh, what is it? Uh, the other, the other terms that are escaping me at the moment, we might, we might put it on Angular with uh, MD Bootstrap as well as if you material design bootstrap. And just real quick and dirty, you know, spend a couple hours, put this on the screen. And it really helps people see the vision because you, number one, you could draw it on a piece of paper and that's kind of helpful. But if somebody else could say, hey, I had a guy that, you know, four hours of bench time did this. And he's like, holy cow, you did this in four hours? Like, what could you do in three months? I was like, well, let's show you, right? I mean, it's, you know, sometimes that's helps with the modernization approach. Uh, I don't know if that, you know, that probably goes beyond the scope of your question, but, oh, I guess where I was going, Hector, with Azure and AWS, you know, on AWS, a lot of people use cloud formation, which is a way to kind of script all the uh, cloud infrastructure that you need. But what we use, uh, you know, we use Terraform uh, and because Terraform works on both AWS and Azure. Now, the uh, the commands that you, you spin up for the, uh, that you run to spin up the different infrastructure components, whether it's a VM or your network security groups and things like that, uh, the commands themselves are gonna be different. There's a, there's a number of similarities, but then when we run our Ansible, which is actually provisioning that uh, server, the Ansible largely is gonna be the same. You know, if you want a Linux server on AWS versus uh, Azure, it's gonna be largely the same. There's a few nuances, but the point is, is you don't have to reinvent everything. And if you take that approach, especially from the beginning, that's gonna minimize change. And on the federal sector, uh, you know, but even commercial, people are sometimes averse to uh, vendor lock-in. Mm -hmm. And the cloud is also considered vendor lock-in. So people really wanna understand what is the cost of being locked in with Azure or AWS? And if I decide to change my mind in the future, what's, what's the cost of making those changes? So thinking about those things up front, I mean, I don't know how it works from a sales, you know, a lot of sales people want to just show you how great this is, but we also like to take into account like, hey, if you, if you don't want to be locked in, you know, this is how easy it'll be changed, you know, to change in the future. And that seems to go a long way too. Mm -hmm. Does that address your question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it, uh, from what you're telling me, there's at least the applications are middleware that can actually uh, t deal with multi multi-cloud applications and, and when you have to have, you know, everything across cloud environments with different vendors and, and that usually alleviates the pain of moving from one prime um, cloud uh, infrastructure uh, environment to a different cloud provider. Yeah, it's not 100% foolproof, but it's definitely uh, gets you a large part of the way. Yep, I, I, I understand. So this is actually, this answers the question. A uh, different question, and I don't know if you have, uh, you know, I just want to, there's, I don't see any more questions, but I, I want to, before I even asked, uh, are there any, anybody that wants to ask a question? I don't see anything on the chat, but I wanted to make sure that at least I would confirm. Don't have any questions, but wanted to um, give a, uh, or mentioned that if the one slide that really resonated with me was the one with the system A and system B. I'm looking at that and I'm like, ah, because I live in the box of manual and auto processes to get data from <laughs> one place to the other. That's your job Whether it be <laughs> that it's, and I, I, and I, but I see it and I'm like, I don't want it to be that way. Like I understand <laughs> like we can, I, in terms of like career goals, and just to add value to our customers, like I just see the pain. I'm like, why? Oh, you know, we can do this for you on a nightly basis and we'll do this and you'll have your data fresh tomorrow. And uh, I, I know there's a better way. Don't know how to do it. Don't know how to go up about doing it, but that's the quest. But anywho, good slide. I saw it and I'm like, ah, oh, somebody gets me. <laughs> well, you know, when you introduced yourself, I, I felt like we were going to have something in common, you know, uh, you know, it, it, quite honestly, too, you know, and I, I have no idea where you're at or, or what company you're with or what agencies or anything like that. Um, would you be open to having an additional conversation outside of this? Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay, sure. And I don't, I mean, I don't have your contact. You have mine. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you're okay with Hector providing me your email if you have that, but we can uh, you know, set up a conversation. You can send it directly privately to him via the chat as well, Joss. If you, if you awesome. Want. 
Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's uh, you know that that's something that I don't know if there's any money in it yet. You know, because obviously there's a contracts game. You know, it just it's the way things work. But I, I really I'm, I'm always very passionate about like kind of what you're mentioning is uh, you know, not only you know seeing these you know inefficiencies. Not it's easy to see an inefficiency, but when you understand it's also the customer's pain point, and and that's where a lot of times we we'll do a quick mock up and just say, hey, look. What do you think about this? Like, what if it were to work this way? And a lot of times just seeing that even at a very notional, like people are like, wow, that's amazing. And, and, you know, being part of a contract, you know, you might not get the work, but, uh, you know, the, the term trusted advisor is kind of an abused, outdated term to some people, but that's actually something that I'm, that I'm really excited about, really passionate about is really being that trusted advisor. Like, look, I don't know what direction you're going to go, but let me at least give you the best advice I can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that goes to like user empathy, and yeah. and you just hear users saying, "Why can't this be like TurboTax? Why can't it be like my app on my phone?" And these are applications that they have to work with for hours of their day, and it's not as simple as what's on their smartphones. Mm-hmm. Is that's actually super uh, interesting because. Uh, Hector, if you recall, on a digital transformation presentation I used to do a number of years ago, uh, that was one of the slides was, uh, I think it was TurboTax, is, uh, was they called Turbo, Turbo Mortgage or whatever they called it? Rocket but that Mortgage. Was Rocket Mortgage, yeah. And it was, you know, push button, get mortgage. You know, that, that was their advertisement, right? It was that easy, push button, get mortgage. And that's kind of what the customers are looking for, right? It's... Yep, exactly. So I, I actually want to uh, wrap up and uh, thank you, Philip, for a great, great discussion. Uh, and I uh, wanted to uh, let you know if you're interested in, in coming back uh, later in the year, just let, uh, reach out. We'll, we'll be able to chat about any upcoming dates that we have in the remainder of the year. Uh, and also sure. pass along any information on any, any vendors that would want to uh, host or sponsor a, a future meetup as well. But I, I wanted to thank you for a great discussion uh, and um, all, all the best. And thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, man.